Boa tarde a todo mundo que está acompanhando nosso primeiro, nossa primeira conversa com editores, é uma organização da Associação Nacional dos Programas de Pós-Graduação em Comunicação, a Compós. O meu nome é Rafael Groma, eu sou diretor científico da Compós e professor do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Comunicação da Unicinos. De hoje até dezembro, a gente vai, uma vez por mês, às quintas-feiras, estar com, em seis encontros com editores de revistas no Brasil e de fora do Brasil, conversando sobre práticas editoriais, ciência aberta, internacionalização, impacto, dicas para publicar, ética em pesquisa. Ao longo desses seis encontros, a gente espera um bate-papo sobre essas questões. Hoje a gente recebe aqui o Larry Gross, editor da, da revista International Journal of Communication, Fábio Pereira, editor da Brazilian Journalist Research, com a moderação da professora Tayane Oliveira, da UF. É, e para abrir a nossa conversa hoje, eu convido a professora Roseli Fígaro, presidenta da Compós. Boa tarde, Roseli. Olá, pessoal, boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, Larry Gross. Uh, eu agradeço a todos os presentes que estão aqui conosco. Quero saudar muito a iniciativa do professor Rafael Goman, é, a Compós tem uma contribuição bastante expressiva a dar nesse campo e eu acho que essas conversas serão muito produtivas. Eu espero que possamos, então, estar juntos uma vez por mês, às quintas-feiras, com esse bate-papo sobre as práticas editoriais. Isso é muito relevante para a nossa área, para todos nós, professores, discentes, pesquisadores, e eu só tenho a saudar essa iniciativa. Quero agradecer muito ao Larry Gross, ao Fábio Pereira e à Tayane uh, Oliveira, aqui faz a mediação desse encontro hoje, então. Eu passo a palavra novamente para o Rafael, deixando aqui os meus desejos de que possa ser essa conversa muito produtiva e muito animada também, não é verdade? Então, muito agradecida e fiquem conosco aqui nesse canal da Compós, na conversa com editores. Obrigada. Muito bem, obrigado, Roseli. É, a partir disso, vou convidar a moderadora do dia, a professora Tayane Oliveira, professora é, do Programa de Pós-Aduação em Comunicação da Universidade Federal Fluminense, que tem pesquisado é, questões como políticas de circulação da ciência, ciência aberta, desinformação científica, e foi editora das revistas Contra Campo e Ecompós. Uh, para o Larry, Tayane Oliveira is an associate, associate professor of communication at the, the Fluminense Federal University, and she researches the, uh, scientific dis disinformation, open science in communication, and circulation of knowledge. And she was uh, editor of Contracampo Brazilian Journal of Communication and Ecompos Journal. Welcome, Tayane. One second. Thank you so much, Rafael. Yeah, thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be here uh, in our first, first meeting uh, with editors. Uh, it's a, a really pleasure and I wanted to uh, congratulate, uh, congratulate for this initiative because it is very important uh, to have this space in our association to discuss uh, scientific policies Uh, scientific productions and uh, uh, have this attention for our uh, journal ju journals. Uh, so uh, we are going to start today with uh, Larry Gross uh, and Fabio Pereira. Larry Gross is professor of communication at the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. He is the founder and editor of the International Journal of Communication and the Annenberg uh, Press Book series. And also we have in this panel Fabio Pereira. Uh, he is a professor of communication at the University of Brasilia and associate research at the research centers Crisis, uh, Rezik Arenas, and he is editor of uh, uh, Brazilian Journalism Research and the Sul, Sul Journalism uh, Journals. 
On behalf of Compoise, I would like to thank you again for accepting to participate in this meeting. And uh, uh, you will have uh, uh, between 15 uh, to 20 minutes to present uh, your journal. And after that, we will open for questions and start our conversation. Larry, uh, please uh, take your time and uh, thank you again uh, to be here with us. Okay, well, I think it, uh, I'll try and speak slowly uh, because I'm speaking in English, of course. Um, I think it might be useful to begin with some background context, at least from my experience. Uh, and I should say, of course, that my experience here is is set within the United States uh, or the United States and Western Europe. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you about the issues and concerns about the degree to which the United States and Western Europe have often dominated the international uh, scene in terms of scholarly publishing and other academic enterprises. But I want to begin talking about the sort of circumstances that led up to the founding of the International Journal of Communication, which I edit. Um, and that goes back to the 1980s and the 1990s when there was a radical transformation in scholarly publishing, certainly in uh, the American and European context, but I think probably uh, at some point elsewhere uh, as well. And that was a form of corporate co-optation of the academic, scholarly, scientific publishing world, which goes back, I mean, that publishing world goes back for centuries. The emergence of science uh, or modern science in Europe uh, several centuries ago was an outcome in many ways of the, the development of print technology and the ability to create a community of scholars across wide distances, across within countries, across countries around the globe to share information, to craft together uh, the knowledge base that, uh, that makes science possible or that constitutes science. And publishing has been the nervous system, the, the sort of um, the circulation system of science from the beginning. Uh, in the late 20th century, uh, a number of um, corporate entrepreneurial figures, in particular, someone named Robert Maxwell, who was a Hungarian emigre uh, to Britain, who had become a publisher, uh, not a very reputable one. Uh, and Maxwell realized, and this involved the purchasing of something called Pergamon Press, realized that scientific publishing was a very particular niche, a very particular part of the publishing ecology, and it was a kind of captive market. Because science, as I said, operates through publication. This is how scientists separated by, you know, in different institutions, different countries, different regions, collaborate in the process of science, which is a collaborative enterprise. Uh, they do it through publication uh, so that you really can't be a member of the scientific community, contribute to it, benefit from it, advance it, without being part of the publication ecology of that science. He realized that these scientific journals, which were a relatively you know, sort of obscure part of the the scholar or the publishing landscape uh, had a great value, which is if you buy them, which he did, uh, or invent them, which he also did, uh, you can begin to charge more and more money because your customer base, the scientists, uh, have no choice. They can't carry on the activities of science without access to these publications. So what Maxwell and then others think of Elsevier, uh, which is a very long-standing company, goes back centuries, but the modern version of Elsevier and others, Taylor and Francis, they all, Reuters, Thompson, and they all kind of buy each other and become bigger and bigger. What these companies began to do in the 80s and the 90s is buy academic presses and begin to raise the prices. And over a period of a decade or so, the cost of academic journals just skyrocketed way faster than anything else. And that had enormous and deleterious contact consequences for the academic um, enterprise. Just to give you one example, 
from the United States, but I assume elsewhere, library, academic, university libraries are were the vehicle, you know, the, the, the customer who would buy these products, buy these journals. As the prices went up, they had to keep paying more for these journals. And they went, would go up by, you know, 100 percent, 200 percent. And some of them became you know, obscene, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year for a uh, for a scientific journal or more. Uh, and the the scientists, you know, at the university would say, we have to have this journal. The libraries, however, had fixed budgets. So as they spent more and more of this scarce budget on the journals, they had less money to buy other things. And the immediate impact of this in the 80s and the 90s in the United States, at least in parts of Europe, was less money available to buy monographs, to buy books from university presses. And the faculty members, particularly young faculty members, whose careers depended upon their ability to publish their work in book form through university presses, found that the presses had uh, fewer resources to publish their work. So there's a kind of domino effect in this ecology that as the journals consume more and more of the scarce resources of libraries, those scholars who depended on book publishing were being squeezed out. So this was a not limited, this was a problem not limited to one corner, but fairly broad. In the late 90s, I am you know, among many other people were concerned about this and beginning to raise questions about what could be done. And it seemed by the late 90s or the beginning of this uh, of the uh, this century that part of the solution should involve utilizing the, uh, the capabilities of online publishing. Online publishing removes many of the aspects of scholarly publishing that publishers would claim justify their their costs. <laughs> For one thing, you don't have to print. So all of the expenses for printing, for paper, for ink, for printing presses go away. Postage, not at all insignificant, particularly when you're at the international uh, context, goes away. It saves time. Copy editing, well, copy editing is still is still real, but uh, formatting, you can change switch formats. You can do all kinds of things, as you all know, uh, with software that used to be done by hand. It used to be done laboriously. If you're old enough, you will remember dealing with publishers about how, how expensive it was to change anything because of typesetting. Well, it's trivial with, uh, with uh, digital software. So it seemed to a lot of us that, well, you know, this should solve some of the problem of these outrageous prices. And you know, I was at conferences or discussions at the end of the 90s and the beginning of this century where people say, all right, let's start seeing what you might call the digital uh, premium, the benefit. Let's see the dividend from this change. It didn't happen. And when I would talk to academic publishers, these corporations, whether it's Wiley or uh, Taylor and Francis or Oxford or others of the big multinational corporations that publish things, they would say, if they were being honest, they would say, well, we don't have a business model. We haven't quite figured out how to integrate online publishing with our, you know, print-based model of selling subscriptions and so forth. And so now to, you know, focus in much more specifically to my own case, I was having a discussion uh, shortly after I arrived here at the University of Southern California. I had previously been at the Annenberg School, the University of Pennsylvania for a long time, 35 years. I arrived here in 2003 and uh, one of my new colleagues was the uh, Manuel Castells, whom I assume most of you have heard of, very eminent sociologist and theorist of the internet age and the network, and a colleague of mine here at the Annenberg School. And we were sharing our frustration with the uh, unwillingness of the existing publishers to take advantage of what you could do with online publishing. So sitting at lunch, we said, well, you know, we could do it ourselves. Um, and we have resources of the Annenberg School. It's not that 
we don't need that many resources, but we we have enough, I think, to get started. And the the truth is, if you look at academic publishing and scholarly publishing, uh, particularly the commercial end of it, whether it's run directly by a uh, publisher or whether it's run by a disciplinary association in conjunction with the publisher, uh, is a um, an unusual form of colonial colonialism, what you might call academic colonialism. And by that, I mean, it's a kind of situation in which the natives, namely academics, scholars, produce the raw material, scholarship. They give it to the publishers, who in this sense are the, you know, East India Company, the, uh, they're the or West India Company, they're the, the colonial power, they give it to them. Then other natives perform the essential labor of refining or perfecting that raw material, namely the reviewing process, uh, also without pay. So the raw material is provided essentially without cost, the essential act of selection, refining, reviewing is provided without cost by the reviewers. And then these colonial enterprises sell it back to the natives at an exorbitant price. It's you know, a particularly regressive form of colonialism in the modern world. However, as I said, it seemed to us that the um, emergence of these new digital technologies allowed us to get away from the colonial model in a number of ways. One is not charging for the, the product. Uh, it requires some subsidy. As I said, it, it's not cost free, but it's nothing like the costs that are charged um, by commercial publishers. So we said we would start an online only journal that would be available to authors and readers without charge, what is now called um, true open access or I don't know, platinum open access. There are different terms now that the publishers have all gotten in open access and are trying to still make money from it somehow, or what they call author processing charges, for example, which can be exorbitant, like $1,000 or more to publish an article. The key ingredient here, though, is the labor of the scholars and the labor of the reviewers. The reviewers are absolutely essential, and that's volunteer contribution. It is a community of, uh, it's a gift economy, whereby members of the community contribute their labor. Without it, the scientific enterprise can't operate. I mean, this has been true for, for centuries. That's how it, well, for a long time, that's how, uh, that's how it works. We also thought that by going online, we could uh, benefit in some other ways, one of which particularly relevant to me and my work and my interests and my students is to incorporate visual material and audiovisual material that print journals have never been good at or willing to do. So we can include lots of pictures. We can include color, which I think you're aware is almost impossible to do. Uh, in a print journal, and we can include uh, moving pictures, sound, recordings, uh, either directly include or links to external sources that work, work very well. So we can broaden what scholarship, what sorts of scholarship can be incorporated into academic publishing in a way that wasn't true before. We also, and this is the case with my journal, with the International Journal of Communication, have been able, because we don't have page limits, we don't have artificial constraints, we have been able to include other contributions that don't fit within the narrow definition of an article. We have what we call forums, where you can have debates, discussions, we can have lectures occasionally. In fact, uh, uh, one of the first forums or we ran in that context was a lecture by a former president of Brazil, Enrique Cardoso who is a good friend, Manuel Castells. Um, we can include other things. We can include discussions. We can include documents. We can take advantage of the, the space and the affordances to be broader. And we don't have page limits. So we can publish more articles and 
particular concern of mine, we can publish more reviews of books, more book reviews, at least in the United States uh, or in the United States and, um, and, and Western Europe. It has long been a concern of mine that academic journals in the field of communication, media and communication, do not publish many book reviews. Yet there are many scholars uh, in the field whose work is largely published as books, not journal articles. And book reviews are an important indicator uh, of their impact, their success when their um, when their you know, application for tenure, for promotion are being considered. Uh, review committees, university committees want to see book reviews. Uh, and for the most part, these book reviews have not been uh, readily available. So we took that very seriously and we have been publishing book reviews. And for years, we have published more book reviews in the International Journal of Communication than all of the other, at least, um, um, ICA and NCA, specifically uh, journals or communication journals put together. We publish over 100 a year, usually, or close to 100 a year, whereas the others publish you know, a dozen, maybe. And this is, I think, uh, very important. Lastly, and reflected in the title of our journal, the International Journal of Communication, uh, it seemed to us that A, this was lacking in the field. Uh, there was, as I'm sure you're all too aware, a, a very significant enduring bias towards uh, the U United States of America and Western Europe in terms of publishing in uh, communication journals, at least English language communication journals. Uh, and yet the field is international, as it should be. Um, the leading association is the International Communication Association, but its flagship journal, the Journal of Communication, overwhelmingly publishes contributions from the United States and Western Europe. Uh, and we aimed to build a more international uh, frame uh, into our title and into our efforts. And I think we have been somewhat successful. We've received uh, in the last year, for example, uh, submissions from 88 countries. But it is still the case that most of the articles published do come from uh, the United States and, and Western Europe, also Australia, China, a few countries. But there are many parts of the world that are still underrepresented in our journal, and this is something we are certainly trying to um, to improve on, to connect with, to recruit and cultivate and publish uh, contributions from around the world. So I think we have demonstrated that it can be done. Uh, it can be done for uh, in a much more accessible way, uh, open access, although uh, as I began, I will you know, maybe conclude by noting this does require subsidy. In this case, it's a matter of benefiting from the resources of a school and a university, in this case, the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California that has resources and is willing to use them to provide this service to the international scholarly community. That's not something you can take for granted, but it's certainly something that one should take advantage of, which is what we've done. Let me stop there and there may be some questions and discussion later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Larry, for this presentation. Uh, you mentioned uh, many points that it's re really important for us to discuss uh, as the, the profitable uh, open access, how open access has become in a profitable uh, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so I think maybe we can talk about it later. And also the policies of interna internationalizations and these calls uh, of uh, the westernization of the, the journals. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now we can uh, move on to uh, Fabio Pereira, uh, editor of uh, Brazilian Journalism Research to present uh, your, your journal. Thank you, Tayane, and thank you all. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to be with you uh, this evening 
And I would like to congratulate uh, Compos uh, Executive Board for this initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's wonderful to share with you uh, some of our experience. And uh, uh, it's nice to see you again, Rafael and Tariana, and to meet you, Larry. So uh, in this brief presentation, I will try to present uh, uh, Brazilian journalism research practice and the challenge that you have uh, concerning open science, uh, most of all. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for, uh, as most of you know, uh, Brazilian journalism research was created in 2005 by the Brazilian Association of Journalism Research. Uh, it's mainly focused, and since the beginning, it's focused on journalism theories and research. Uh, and I think that uh, it was a context of the strength of journalism studies in Brazil. I think that uh, the Brazilian Association of Journalism Research understood that we had a critical ma mass that could uh, feed a journal with quality research and uh, that could read this kind of research uh, for this own uh, study, for most of this, his own work. So I think SVPJ understood that and uh, created this journal. And if it, even if we uh, encourage uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, on journalism, journalism remains uh, as our main object in, in Brazilian journalism research. Uh, since the beginning, uh, Brazilian journalism research is edited in English, and uh, I think that uh, they, they were worried at this time with the internationalization of our research, so we have an English name and etc. And in 2008, uh, we started to accept submissions in Portuguese and publish a bilingual issue. So uh, now we publish an, Eng uh, an English issue uh, that have uh, versions on another Latin, Latin language. Uh, from my standing point, I think that uh, our journal have a double mission. Uh, first of all, I think that's a tool to present and diffuse Brazilian journalism studies to the international research community. So I think that uh, the idea was that uh, uh, we have quality research in Brazil, so if you have them accessible to a larger audience by translating this research to, the, to English, people can access this research and you can promote the internationalization of our research. So I, I think the first mission was that we have to contribute to that our quality research could be uh, understandable and accessible for everyone. Uh, the other concern and I think that's harder to accomplish, was that I think the idea is to, to, to make the journal a space to promote the creation of international research networks on journalism studies. And I think this is a long-term strategy. So the idea is if you publish good research and if you attract uh, researchers from different countries to publish in our journal, and if they access what we are publishing in Brazil, maybe people from Brazil and from abroad can connect, can know each other, and you can start to publish collaborative research on journalism. So I think it's hard to develop this the second mission, and I think we start to accomplish that in the last the last years. Uh, to illustrate uh, this, this vo international vocation of uh, Brazilian journalism research, I can tell that uh, historically, one third of the journal content consisted of international articles. Uh, this number increased on the last two years after we were indexed at the Scopus and the, at the Emerging Citation Social, uh, Emerging Citation Science Index at Web of Science. So I can tell you that between 40 and 50 percent of our content now is uh, written by international researchers researchers from uh, non-Brazilian researchers. Uh, it, and at the other hand, uh, in the last year, uh, almost a half of our readers came from outside Brazil. And I, I can tell you that you have readers, most of the readers from Europe and North America, uh, Western Europe and North America, so UK, Spain, Portugal, United States and Canada, but you have uh, e a lot of readers from China, Indonesia, India, Mozambique. So, I think that we are becoming a journal that can somehow promote a kind of a, a soft north dialogue, a soft north bridge in the specific field of journalism studies. Well, to do that, uh, there's a lot of work. We count uh, on a team of 
team of eight editors. Six of them are from Brazil, one are from Mexico, another one is from the US. Uh, some of them stopped working with us this year because uh, we have a lot of work in the last years. The, the, the fact that we are receiving more manuscripts and we need more uh, qualified editors, so we start recruiting new people. And we are also renewing our team, so we are somehow in the middle of a transition process and our editorial staff will change in the next year. We also have 16 members of our scientific board from different countries that help us uh, in, on the desk review process, so some of them are asked to, to make the first uh, review of the papers we receive, and we count on them to help us to think about the journal's future. So uh, once a time uh, each year, we make a meeting and we start to present and discuss the journal policies with these uh, members of our scientific board and we try to, 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 to think about what can you do to improve uh, our journal, to improve the quality of our of our content. And I, I really would like to highlight that editing uh, Brazilian journalism research is a collective work. So I'm here representing the journal, but uh, we always try to share the responsibilities and the decisions among all the members of the editorial board. And I really want to like to thank them all for this help and the patience and the fact that we work a lot to make the, the, the journal published every year. As I said, the number of submissions we uh, receive have increased in the last years, so we receive about 100 manuscripts each year. We are able to publish only 30 articles that makes three, three, three issues per year, each issue with 10, 10 articles. We release the journal, as some of you know, on April, August and December. And now we receive and process submissions in Portuguese and English, but also in Spanish and French. In the case uh, some of them are accepted, authors uh, should provide an English translation of the articles in order to be published. Uh, even manuscripts we receive submitted to a plagiarism detection software and we become more and more attentive on plagiarism and self-plagiarism self situations. And after that, uh, we make a, a preliminary review and we check if the article attempts to some excellence criteria that, that before moving uh, the article to the blind review process. So we check the international scope, uh, if the article is original, the quality of the theoretical and methodological approach, and then you see the results if you are, they are really innovative and interesting. So uh, this first stage of the desk review, the preliminary review, takes about a month, and most of the submissions do not pass uh, this, this first moment. And the idea is to not overload uh, the blind reviews editors and send to this blind review only the articles that have potential, have potential to be published. And the, at the same time, the idea is to send back to the authors as soon as possible uh, the article uh, in case of desk rejection, so they they, he or she can uh, publish it, uh, to meet it uh, elsewhere. Uh, the article that passes the desk review goes to the second stage and uses the regular double blind review process. So there's nothing new in this case. You send it to two uh, qualified reviewers from different specialists in the, on the subject of the article, uh, recognized on this field and uh, sometimes you ask for a third opinion and at the end you decide if you can move on to publish the article or not, if you can ask for change, etc. And all the review process from the first submission until the final acceptance or, or rejection notice of the article should take about six, seven months, no more than that. And sometimes it, this is not possible and I think that uh, this is a common problem to everyone who acts a journal. I don't know uh, how, how is the case of the International Journal of Communication, but uh, we have always a problem to, to find a good, good and available reviewers. Uh, mainly if uh, uh, we receive articles from very specific subjects that needs a, a very specialized uh, know-how, so we have always problem to find good reviewers. So one of our concerns now is how to stimulate people to help us on this process and make good reviews uh, that could uh, somehow contribute to improve our content, to improve the quality of the articles we publish. 
After you accept the article, there's a long copy review process and you have to revise the text, check the reference, see if the article is understandable for a large scientific audience before sending it to publication. And you have uh, sometimes with Brazilian authors a kind of negotiation to, to ask them to explain sometimes some uh, national idiosyncrasies, some situations to vet to some situations that are very specific of Brazilian context and can be understandable only by Brazilian readers. So, so sometimes the author talks about uh, something uh, concerning the, our political or media system uh, that a, 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 a foreign reader cannot understand because it's very Brazilian. So you ask them to explain, to make a, an extra effort to explain them to a large audience uh, following the idea that we would like always to promote the international debate on our, on our uh, content. Before finishing uh, this presentation, I would like to talk about uh, our open science initiatives, uh, sometimes, something that we start to develop in the last few years. And I really would like to, to thank Tayane because I learned a lot of, of, on the subject with her. I met her on the first time in 2018. And to tell you the truth, she's the Brazilian specialist in this stuff. So Tayane, please correct me if I say something wrong about uh, open science, because you, you know more than me. Uh, besides the fact that we're always, we were always an open access journal, in the last years we shared this concern of making our content and our procedures more accessible to the, to the society and to the public. And I think that this is linked, this concern is linked to the fact that science is under attack in Brazil. Due to ideological cause, as most of you know, uh, the government do not like science. They he, uh, it does not like who thinks different from, from it. Uh, but I think that some people distrust science in Brazil because they, do not, they don't know how, how it's produced. Uh, people don't understand science. So we are trying to make our process and our decisions more transparent to authors and to readers. For example, we encourage uh, authors to uh, send their submissions in the, in, as preprints uh, and uh, uh, in order to be evaluated uh, by open review procedures, uh, but to be uh, openly reviewed. Or when this is not possible, uh, we, we try to con we consult the reviewers after they did the review and then we ask them if we can publish their reviews and review their names to the authors and to the readers if the article is published. So if you enter in Brazilian journalism research now, and if you open an article, and if you go to, to the end of this article, you see a link. And if you click this link, you can see the review that was done on this article. You can know who did this, this review. You can know what was asked to the authors. You can know uh, 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 how the review contributed to improve the article. And I think that's a way to explain to people how the process work and to explain the role of the, the reviewers on this process. To, 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 I think that you have to valorize the intellectual work that is to read an article, to comment an article and help someone to make an article better. So we try to, to make this by publishing the reviewers since uh, the review authorizes us to make that. Uh, and finally, uh, we also make available uh, an open data repository so authors could share the data with other researchers if they want. Uh, people do not really use that as we wish, but uh, we would like to encourage the spreads and make data available, data associated to articles that we published available to everyone. And now we are studying a way to make our articles more accessible to a larger audience. So uh, some of my colleagues in the editorial board are working on a science communication program in order to make Brazilian journalism research interesting and relevant to ordinary people. And I think that we have, uh, we have a first draft of this initiative this initiative in the end of the year, uh, maybe a, a, a podcast or, or, or a YouTube live where, where uh, 
editors could comment uh, the, 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 the issue, the, the authors, the subjects uh, in, in, a, in a more accessible language. So to be honest, very honest, I'm not sure if all these open science initiatives will really work. Sometimes I think my, my fellow, my colleagues and, and the other researchers are fear of changing their views and adopting these open science practices. I, I see that there's a, a resistance, for example, uh, in Brazil to deposit an article as a preprint, for example. But I think that you should try. I think that it's important to try, so, and so we try. Anyway, I hope, uh, I think I make the tour of how you work. I hope you could understand all that I said and thank you again for this invitation. And I am really glad to listen to you after that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabio. Uh, first of all, I think uh, that is um, a, a really important uh, work that uh, Brazilian journalism research has been done uh, to improve these uh, open science initiatives. Uh, so I want to, I would like to congratulate uh, you for this. But uh, I think you were so generous and sweet to say that I am as open as open science specialist in Brazil. No, I am just an enthusiast <laughs> and also a critic because as open access has been uh, transformed in a, a profitable uh, uh, enterprise, open science is also uh, being transformed, being appropriated in a, a good and a, a profitable uh, enterprise. So, um, we have to, to understand how uh, science works, how the, the science, scientific circuits, uh, the dynamics uh, and the commercial dynamics in the, the scientific circuits also works. But uh, uh, even though congratulations for these efforts, because uh, we know how hard uh, is it to uh, it is to uh, edit in a journal and to improve open science uh, uh, policies in our uh, journals. So uh, while we are receiving the, the, the questions from the audience, I, I, uh, I, I would like to uh, bring uh, two questions. For, uh, the first of them, it, uh, the first of uh, this question is about internationalization and uh, an older one is about uh, open access policies because uh, your presentation uh, bring these topics uh, for us, and so I think it's uh, really important for us to discuss this. Discuss it. Uh, 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 the first question I want to um, uh, to say to to ask you is uh, how uh, do you see uh, the, the internationalization? What are the internationalization policies that the journal has uh, that that the journal have? Uh, because the, the international uh, uh, journal, uh, uh, the international journal of communication, uh, has the the, the 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 title of the the journal, uh, the the international comprehension, and the Brazilian journalism research, although it's uh, geolocated, is uh, even uh, e each uh, even more and more uh, improving uh, initiatives and policies to attract the foreign and to publish in the, the journal. So I would like to list uh, uh, from you, listen from you, uh, what do you think about internationalization and how this, uh, the, what are the policies uh, to improve more uh, inclusive uh, 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 people, uh, review as uh, Barbara asked in the, the chat and also Denise. Uh, also, Denise Tavares also uh, did a question about the interest, uh, for example, the International Journal, uh, com uh, the International Journal of Communication, to have more uh, space for Latin America in the editorial board, and also Barbara asked in the chat to how it works the the invitation uh, to the the uh, compose the editorial board. So that's my question. How do you see the internationalization for your journal? You were without microphone, Larry. Oh, sorry. 
Um, I think I should. I haven't changed anything. You can't hear me. Yes, yes, I am hearing you. Okay, so I can see the questions from Barbara Heller. Let me respond to those and then to your question. How long it takes from first submission to final acceptance? Uh, I wish I had the exact uh, answer to that, but I would say we're very much within the range of the other journals that I know, at least in, in communication. Uh, and I would say that they're uh, the primary factor in terms of the time uh, is dependent upon how long it takes us to recruit reviewers, something that we've already heard about, you know, the importance of recruiting the right reviewers, uh, how much reviewers are uh, able to complete their work on time. Some reviewers are very efficient, some not very efficient. And then when articles are being revised, and I would say that most articles that are published undergo at least one round of revision, whether authors are prompt and efficient in conducting the revisions. What we do, and what I think is important uh, here, is that here at the journal, we take very little time. If some, When something has been reviewed, we don't take a long time before deciding. Uh, we don't, there's no delay here at the, um, at the center, uh, at, the, at the journal, but we are dependent upon the willingness of reviewers to agree and then to do what they what they promise and authors to revise. But I think we're we're within the typical scope. Editors and reviewers are not paid. Uh, that's as I said earlier, it's a gift economy. It's part of the the moral community, if you like, of scholarship, and it's what uh, it's what makes it particularly important, I think, to recognize the contributions that are made. Reviewers are the essential ingredient to make this enterprise work, uh, and they're not paid. The only thing we've been able to do, and I think it's, uh, I hope it's, it's helpful, is we acknowledge the contributions from reviewers, and uh, now we send every year a letterhead, you know, a, a, a formal letter of thanks to every reviewer uh, that in some cases we hope will be useful for them at their local institution as a sign of their service, of their contributions. Uh, we can't afford to pay reviewers. And I mean, we have anywhere between 15 and 1800 reviewers a year. Uh, and this is, as I said, essential. Uh, there was a, let me just respond to this question. There was a question about whether we accept articles already published in proceedings. I would say we don't have a strict rule on that. I wouldn't rule it out, but I would say we don't, we, we wouldn't do it without thinking about the nature of the proceedings and so forth, because in some fields, proceedings are pretty much the standard form of publication. So it might be uh, redundant. Um, to respond to the some of the other questions you were asking about internationalization, the westernization, other terms, I think the primary way we do this is by uh, publishing work that comes from and speaks to, speaks about uh, many parts of the world. Uh, and as we publish more, it sends a message, I hope, to uh, scholars and readers uh, in other parts of the world that their work is of interest to us. There's a way in which when you publish work from one particular part of the world, uh, more scholars from that part of the world begin to see our journal as a place that would be interested in their work. One example uh, uh, in, in recent years is we've published a lot of work by scholars from Turkey about uh, research that is focused on or based in, in Turkey. And as we publish, we uh, we get more submissions. There's a kind of uh, virtuous circle, if you like, uh, that is important there. So we, we try and do that. There's another point that I think is is um, is critical to doing this, and that's to understand that it isn't necessary for research done outside of the United States or Europe to 
be localized in a way that research done, let's say, in the United States or Europe is not. So, for example, if you publish an article, if we publish an article, people write an article about some, say, social media or political issue or public health issue, research conducted in the United States, they rarely, if ever, probably never, specify the United States. That's taken for granted. Whereas authors writing from other parts of the world often talk about this particular issue in Korea, this particular issue in Kenya, this particular issue in Brazil, as in they feel the need, and reviewers often convey this, uh, they feel the need to you know, sort of localize it in a way that research coming from the West doesn't. And we've tried to make clear both to authors and to reviewers that that's a double standard that we don't believe in. Uh, the topic is important. You don't necessarily have to have a sort of parenthetical localization of it. And in particular, this, this shows up very often in uh, in sort of making it clear to reviewers that we don't want them or need them, or even in some cases permit them to apply what uh, I think could be seen as a double standard to who has to be uh, marked and who doesn't. This is somewhat parallel to the realization in, uh, uh, in, in language that there's a difference between the marked and the unmarked case. Uh, and um, this is something that I think contributes to a sense of internationalization, that things outside of the, the West uh, don't need to be marked as special in that way. I hope that's responding to your question. Oh, there was a question about the editorial board. The editorial board is largely, well, the original editorial board was set up in order to demonstrate the seriousness of the journal, because the editorial board is one of the ways in which journals are credible. Uh, after that, it evolves through the recruitment or the addition of people who we have been working with. And the more people review, uh, the more likely they are to be asked to join the editorial board. Some people ask to join the editorial board, and we often say this, we'd be happy to, to have you. We're always willing to consider uh, volunteers in that way. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, could you please um, uh, respond also what Denise Tavares asked to, uh, to you about the Latin America in editorial board? Uh, she asked if, um, let me see uh, what she said said, I'm so sorry, she asked, that there are no Latin America on EJOC editorial board. Uh, is there any interest in Latin America discussion? Uh, could you please um, talk a little more about it? I mean, I'm looking at the editorial board right now. So Pablo Boskowski, who is at Northwestern, uh, is, as I hope you're aware, um, Argentinian, and in fact, his recent book, Abundance, he just published, is largely about research in Argentina. I agree, he's in the United States now. Um, looking further down, I know Sergio Godoy is a longtime member of our editorial board from Chile. Um, I think there are uh, one or two others. There's Manuel uh, Guerrero from uh, Iberoamericana in Mexico. Um, I think there are some there are some others. I certainly would agree that we are not sufficiently uh, representing, and I think there's some others. I don't want to uh, sort of be looking in the wrong place. I know there are some others, uh, and we certainly are willing. I I would say, and it's uh, you know it's, it's very clear that we have been less uh, able to represent uh, scholarship from Brazil. Uh, and it's been my experience in general that Portuguese-based scholarship has not been as well represented in the international uh, context as Spanish-based uh, publication. I suspect I'm telling you things you know better than I do. Uh, but we are open to it. And in fact, at the moment, 
I'm aware of at least two or three articles, uh, we've recently published articles from Brazilian scholars, uh, and we have several that are under review right now. In fact, just yesterday or the day before, I was dealing with a uh, sending out for revision uh, uh, an article from, from by Brazilian scholars. So we're, we're quite open to it, and I'm very happy and, and would welcome initiatives from people to connect with us and say we would like to open a channel. Um, this has been fine. I know the International Communication Association, which I, when I was president, one of our uh, important focal, focal areas was building relationships in many parts of the world. And I arranged a regional conference we held in Santiago, um, 20, I forget now the year, 14, 15, somewhere in there. Uh, and there were several hundred people from around Latin America, including uh, Brazil, who were there. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a work in progress, but it's not true that we're not interested and it's not true that there are no uh, Latin American um, scholars on our editorial board, because there are. And lots of reviewers. I want to sort of agree with what was said earlier about the importance of reviewers. They are absolutely essential. And I take as my <clears throat> editorial responsibility, as my editorial job, the most important thing that I do is try and recruit appropriate reviewers for articles. There is no way that an editor, one person, is competent to judge work across the field of communication. There are areas in which I would feel competent, areas related to my own research work I've done with students, but we're a very broad journal. We're not the journal of you know, this kind of communications. We're not health communication. We're not political. We're the journal of communication. So I am very aware that I am incompetent to provide a, an appropriate review for most of the articles that we review. What I try and do, based in part on my experience, I've been a faculty member in communication for over 50 years now, uh, take advantage of this, to try and select and recruit appropriate reviewers, and then to decide whether the reviews, and again, I suspect I'm not always right, whether the reviews are fair, whether the reviews are open-minded rather than you know, just trying to find somebody who agrees with them, so that you decide, you know, is this reviewer somebody uh, that I should um, take seriously? So that's the editorial job, and that ultimately rests with whoever the, uh, the editor is or the, the editors are, but the reviewers are, are essential. I just want to comment on one other thing that, um, that Fabio said. If I understood you, uh, dealing with this open science thing, um, you may not be preserving the an anonymity of reviewers. The standard of, you know, double blind review in science has tended to assume that the reviewers don't know who the author is, the authors are, and the authors don't know who the reviewers are. Now, in many cases, the identity of the author is impossible to disguise. Uh, particularly in subfields. I mean, there are just many, many cases where anyone, the way I would put it is, anyone who was competent to review in many subfields is going to have a very good idea who the authors are because they know who's doing the work in that field. Now, they may not know exactly who it is. It might be the student of X rather than X, or it might be an associate, but they've got a, a pretty good idea. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem. At least it's very hard to overcome. And you know, hiding them, making them anonymous doesn't really work either. Because if you know the field, you know who's doing things. What I take seriously, in fact, I'm almost willing to give up the anonymity of authors. I think it, I'm not sure it matters, although I have seen cases. I have certainly seen cases where fairly prominent scholars have gotten criticisms that they may not have gotten had the reviewer known who the author was you know, what we call a halo effect in psychology. You know, the fact that it was written by so-and-so might overcome the weaknesses that are apparent when it's anonymous. But I am very concerned with, with maintaining the anonymity of reviewers. Because again, I've seen many cases where reviewers have 
said things in effect to very eminent and senior scholars that they might not be willing to say if their name was attached to it. You know, there's an honesty uh, and a candidness that I think anonymity protects. Now, having said that, I'm also aware that reviewers can often hide behind anonymity and behave badly. And that's the goal of the, the role of the editor is to try and, and guard against that or to weigh such things and say, oh, you know, that's not really fair. Uh, but my understanding of open science, including you know, the procedures, the data and all of that, which I support, does not include the, um, the, 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 the identity of reviewers. That I prefer to, to maintain uh, anonymously. Thank you so much, Larry, uh, for, for your attention to uh, respond to Denise Tavares and complement also with uh, a question for uh, Fabio Pereira. Uh, Fabio, if you could uh, talk about the, the, the question that I mentioned before about the internationalization, how does be, uh, the Brazilian journalism research comprehend the internationalization? What are the, the challenges? Uh, to uh, attract foreign to the, the publisher, and also if you wanted to uh, uh, comment about the, the, the issue of the reviewers, the, the anonymity of the reviewers, uh, please. Uh, I, I just uh, start, I will just start with the, the review question. What you, do you do is uh, to ask the reviewer to the, in the, at the end of the process, so when they mark the form, if you like to review our name uh, and authorize, we will be glad to publish your, your full review in your name. And if you say yes, we uh, make a, a copy of the review. And before publishing, we ask again the review, are you sure that you publish that? And if you say yes, we make that. Uh, because, uh, and, and it's very interesting because the reviewer thinks very, likes to publish that, they see no problems to review his, na his name, and sometimes the authors uh, become embarrassed to have the reviewer exposed because it shows that the, the article had fragilities and it improved uh, during the review process. So I understand uh, uh, Larry's concern and I understand that uh, if you make that uh, without some prep, so without uh, thinking a lot, that can provoke some uh, some fights, some problems, and we try to preserve our reviewers because we know the importance. But uh, we try to say to, to tell the, 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 the reader that at the end, uh, uh, it's not only the author that is in charge of the quality, the final quality of the article, but someone read that uh, point a lot of things that can be improved, and. Uh, uh, after the author accepted these, these suggestions, the article becomes better. So you have to thank the reviewer due to this intellectual work. So what you do, it's, we are experimenting too. Uh, we try to, to see if it works. Uh, that's not, that we had no problems until now, but if you have problems, you can review that without any, any problem. Uh, about uh, internationalization, I know that uh, this is an injunction that everybody talks about to have to become international, etc. I have that uh, we not have to pursue uh, internationalization only to because you have to become international. You not have to publish every paper that you receive, uh, even if it's uh, uh, written from, from an international author. So we not we not. Uh, uh, um, make these, we are very critical to the pro this process too, but we think that it's important to the science in general to be diffused to uh, a larger public, to be read to a larger public, to produce impact in the all, on all the world. So we really believe that. Uh, use some of the standard policies that other journals in Brazil use to, uh, uh, to capture and to attract international authors. Uh, so we make international special issues and invite international editors to add to these issues. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a language policy that try to, to help uh, this kind of change. So we publish in English, but we accept submissions of other languages. So if you uh, uh, are from 
I don't know, from Senegal, and you are not able to read, write the first version of a paper in English, you submit it in French, we evaluate it in French, and after the US for a translation, and that makes it easier for people that don't have a, a, a good, uh, cannot write English, so easy to, 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 to work with us, to submit uh, papers for us. Uh, the fact that we become indexed helped a lot, and you receive a lot of uh, papers from from different countries since you become indexed. And you have to recognize that uh, uh, people, uh, most a lot of countries, and not only Brazil, are asking journals to become indexed, are demanding authors to publish at indexed journals, and that's a problem. And the fact that we are indexed. Uh, 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 help us to receive articles from this, this, these countries. A lot of articles from Latin America and from Africa and Asia because they know that you have, we are at Scopus and they, they can find us and send a paper and they, they will um, show that to, to the government they, that they published on an indexed government. Uh, Another, we have another, other, other strategies. We try to recruit reviewers from different countries even if you receive uh, submissions from Brazil. Então, so, it's, uh, you can uh, send a, as a paper and then at the end of the process receive a review in English or in Spanish because you know that uh, uh, Spanish-speaking reviewers can read Portuguese and you can read a review in Spanish and you can you try to open uh, our journal to, to, to all the world and, and try to confront the authors uh, to commentaries from reviewers from all the other countries to, to broke this kind of, uh, because Larry told us we can recognize the authors from our field in Brazil, for example, it's very, a very close uh, environment. So if I, I receive something on data journalism in Brazil, I cannot ask for a Brazilian to, 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 to evaluate because you know who will evaluate that. The author you know and the reviewer you know the author. So I, I try to ask someone from, from Spain or someone from Portugal, someone from Mexico, and in this case you try to open more the reviewers, the review process. Uh, another uh, uh, measure that you take is to not reproduce at Brazilian journalism research a, colonist, a, a, a colonial approach, a colonialistic approach. On, on, on this, on, on, on the internationalization. So we try to not disqualify articles from Global South. We try not to receive an article from Africa and say, ah, in Africa, they don't have quality papers because they have. So we try to read and valorize the articles from different traditions and not only to attract articles from Europe or, or, or United States because they are the central, the main part of science. But we try to, to, to look, to have articles at the same way. And I think that's why we are becoming a journal that are publishing or are being seen as a journal that publishes uh, quality science on Latin American journalism studies, for example. And uh, it, uh, we try to make a partnership with the American Association of Journalism and Mass Communication Education to create an award to, to the best articles in, on journalism in Latin America, and we publish the, 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 the winners at Brazilian Journalism Research, that's the initiative that you, you finished on the next, next month, so we have news on the subject. But at the end, I know that's a long way, not only to become international because uh, receive uh, papers from other countries, not so, so hard, but becoming internationally relevant, I think that uh, it will take a long, a long time. It's hard. It's not so easy. That's it. Uh, I, I also have seen this. Thing, no? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for your explanation and your um, uh, clarification about your the, the comprehension of Brazilian journalism research on the. Uh, no, no Western uh, perspective of internationalization. Thank you so much, uh, Fabio. Uh, I would like to um, bring another question uh, on what you, uh, both of you, presented uh, before on the open access uh, policies. Uh, 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 both of the journals uh, do not um, charge uh, uh, the, the authors to publish uh, in, in the, the, the journal. Uh, 
we have been seen uh, the growing of these kind of policies, especially after the, the, the publication of the plan as uh, the, the coalition plan of, from Europe uh, that has been uh, transforming, improving these uh, policies of uh, uh, article processing charges uh, to open access. And uh, uh, both of journals, uh, especially here from Latin America, as we do, uh, it's all our tradition uh, to do not charge the author from since the 90s because uh, we uh, uh, were uh, uh, constructing this kind of uh, policies of open access uh, a long term. Uh, so, uh, but, but, and both of the journal work with this no APC uh, for open access. So, I would like to hear from you how. Uh, uh, to sustain uh, uh, a journal uh, with uh, this kind of model. Uh, and uh, if uh, uh, your experience could be an example that another open access uh, model is possible for the, the rest of the world. <laughs> As I said when I was talking earlier, my journal is possible because it's subsidized. Uh, now, I'm, I'm well aware that although uh, the subsidy is necessary, I mean, we, we do what we do, um, it's not nearly as much money as you would think uh, if you look at what commercial publishers uh, charge, which is outrageous. It, you know, there, there's just no relationship given that as we've said now several times the essential ingredients for this commercial operation are provided without cost authors are not paid reviewers are not paid and for the most part editors are not paid i mean editor might get a stipend but it's really nobody lives nobody makes a living nobody is supported by uh, whatever stipend they might get as a uh, as the editor of an academic journal, I'm not paid for it. Although it's part of what I do as a, you know, as a professor at the university, it's part of my uh, my service to the to, to the field. So commercial publishers are in a market where they charge uh, a rate that is independent of any meaningful relationship to cost, and they get away with it for the reasons I said earlier that the scientific community depends on it. I mean, the way science works, you need this medium of publication. Open access is a way or is intended as a way to get around that. And things like Plan S, other of these moves, come about because public institutions, governments in particular, start saying, wait a second, we're paying for this. Why should you know, we then pay these exorbitant amounts to commercial publishers? So it's beginning to unravel, but that doesn't mean there aren't still costs. Uh, and in this case, I believe, uh, and have been so far able to, um, you know, been successful in in pushing this belief that universities with resources, which is in this case a private university in the United States, should make a contribution to the field. Now the university benefits from it. You know, it gives us visibility, it gives the school uh, prestige and visibility, it pays off in these rankings that, you know, universities take very seriously and students take seriously. So there is a there is a benefit there, but it's a contribution to the field. Uh, somebody has to be paying for it. I think auth author processing charges are a very unethical way to do it because authors are not the place where the resources are. Author processing charges just, you know, historically began because research grants in the United States and in, and in Europe from, let's say, government um, funders could include money for dis dissemination of results. So the publishers realized that there was money there, that research grants provided money and they could then start charging authors. Once they got into this idea of charging authors and open access came along, then they said, all right, we'll yield to this open access demand, but we'll tap the authors now as the charges. Well, 
there are some authors who have funds through research grants, but most don't. And once you add author processing charges, you've taken the most vulnerable piece of this puzzle and you know, the, the most vulnerable section of this ecology and asked them to bear the costs. It's ridiculous. Uh, and it's not the way to go. One other piece of this, and I'm now speaking specifically about the United States and, and, and Europe, or not only, uh, the disciplinary associations, because traditionally a lot of academic publishing comes from disciplinary associations. The International Communication Association, which I've been more involved with, and in the United States, the National Communication Association, they each publish a bunch of journals. The International Communication Association publishes, I think, now six journals. They publish most of those journals through commercial publishers, and they get royalties. And the royalties they get, the International Communication Association gets a lot of money. In fact, most of its revenue comes not from membership dues, which they try and keep as low as possible, but from publishing revenues. And as the pressure for real open access through Plan S and other things becomes a reality, these disciplinary associations are going to have to accommodate to, deal with, relate, you know, come to terms with a change in their situation because they have been funded by this commercial publishing model. And, you know, they're in the middle of it. I've been on committees and task forces trying to figure out how that can be, uh, how that can be done to figure out, to come up with a, with an economic model that does not depend on revenues from commercial publishers, you know, because open access, open, you know, open, open science, open access is going to undermine this, this model. And you know, no, no one's yet come up with an answer, but they're certainly aware of it. Thank you so much. Fabio, do you want to add something? No, I, I will talk, uh, I, I agree with Larry, I will talk about uh, our experience more specifically. Uh, in the case of our journal, uh, the fact that you have a Brazilian Association of Journalism Research that founds a lot of things, helps a lot. Uh, and I know that we are in another, on a different situation of uh, when compared with uh, journals that are edited by universities uh, undergraduate programs, graduate programs. Uh, I think that the fact that we are considered, uh, that the, the, the professors are, uh, and the editors are public functionaries in Brazil also helps a lot that, because you are said that if you are public uh, functionaries, you have to, to work for the society. So there is not a problem for us to work uh, freely as an editor. Uh, I think that, uh, 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 so I, I think we can keep this kind of operation as an open access journal uh, in this, this model, and I think that we can keep uh, Brazilian journalism research working as it works. I'm not sure if we can expand too much the journal operation uh, in this model, because uh, if you wanted to publish, for example, six issues uh, on a, a year, for example, it's impossible in this model with uh, a funding that's important but not sufficient to to to, to contract uh, other 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 person and uh, counting on the the, the 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 collaboration of the, the, the of our colleagues. So I, I think that maybe uh, we, we have to discuss this with the government. We have to discuss the funding of the, the science in Brazil, the science publication in Brazil. You have to discuss that uh, our role as editors must be uh, somehow recognized because when we launch this function on the, the reports that we send to the government, they say, okay, it's good, you are editor, but it does not really count on our evaluations. And I think that people are not really uh, interested in on becoming editors because at the end you work a lot, there's a lot of work, and you are not really recognized by the government and sometimes by the university, by the university. That's all. Thank you so much, Fabio. Sometimes the, the, the work uh, on the, the academic work uh, is 
uh, comprehend as a vocational, uh, as a, 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 a free uh, contribution to the field. And that, that is a problem because sometimes it also can be comprehended as a precariousness of our uh, labor. Uh, in this uh, point of view, in this perspective, I would like to bring uh, two questions from the audience. Uh, the first of one is uh, from José Aidar Prado. Uh, he asks, what is the annual uh, cost of producing uh, the International Journal of Communication? And of course, uh, if you want to uh, extend it to Brazilian journalism research, Fabio, uh, free uh, free, feel free to do it. And also, uh, Cassio Lucas asked how to value the review labors, and not only the reviewers' labors, but also the editor, editors' labors, and uh, all this kind of uh, uh, labor that uh, work that we don't, uh, as a way not uh, uh, through the payment, but uh, through uh, recognizing. Uh, so um, I would like to bring these two questions for you. Well, I can answer some of that. Um, the cost of the international journal communication um, is uh, it's either substantial or remarkably uh, reasonable, depending on your perspective. We have uh, two professional editors who are, um, are part of our staff. We have a managing editor. Uh, for, year, for many years, that was Arlene Locke, who was, uh, began the journal with me uh, 50, 16 years ago, whatever, uh, and she retired last year. She's been replaced by Katie uh, Bell Garcia, uh, and we've also hired a part-time managing editor, Kasia Anderson, who handles special sections and book reviews. So, but she's part-time. But we have we have a full-time uh, professional editor who uh, handles the flow of articles, monitors things, and. and keeps it all working, does a lot of, there's a lot of work to do, uh, even when we're just published online. Uh, there's some technical support that's provided through the university, through our uh, university technical support. And we also outsource some technical work to companies that specialize in you know, working on things I don't understand. Uh, and very importantly, we have a number of doctoral students who work as assistant editors. Uh, it's part of their engagement as doctoral students. So in effect, it's a cost, although you know, they'd be supported anyway, whether they're research assistants or teaching assistants. In this case, they work with the journal. They benefit. It's actually a remarkably good experience for a doctoral student to sort of see how, you know, as we say in this country, see how the sausage is made, you know, get backstage to see how reviewing is handled, to often help locate reviewers, to help suggest reviewers. Um, and, and that's work, that's work. I mean, that's our cost because if we didn't have already, if that cost wasn't already covered by the support we give the students, then it would be an additional cost. So to, to count it up, we have some professional staff, we have the, the labor of doctoral students, and we have technical costs, IT costs. What we don't have is paper costs, printing costs, postage costs that are, in fact, quite a significant factor. Many years ago, in the 1980s, I edited a paper journal that was at the University of Pennsylvania. And I certainly know there that printing and paper costs and postage costs are significant. And that we don't have. But there are professional costs involved. If we weren't able to um, you know, to obtain those uh, subsidies from the from the university, from the Annenberg School, then it would have to be done on a volunteer basis, and it would be much more difficult. We could publish less, uh, and we would be much more constrained. We have the resources. We also, however, I should note one other factor. We publish special sections, which are what are usually called special issues. Usually, these are proposed to us by scholars They've done a conference and they think the papers could be expanded into a special section or they have an idea for pulling things together. And we've published a, an average of 10 a year of these uh, and they expand our capabilities quite a bit. 
In those cases, we ask the organizers, the editors of a special section, to try and come up with some funding resources from uh, from there and from their institution, from grants, from other things, because these are real costs. I mean, they're actual costs. Uh, and we often succeed. We have published special sections without any contributions from the editor's institutions, but for the most part, people do have those resources. And frankly, uh, I can't ask the University of Southern California to provide resources that a, another institution uh, would appropriately provide. Those funds help defray some of our some of our, our costs, but there are expenses involved. You know, it's not uh, it's not expense free. I I will try I will try to talk about the second question. I don't have an answer to tell you the truth, but I think that the first step is to recognize that this is a work. It's, uh -huh. uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. It takes the same times. Uh, it ta takes times as uh, doing doing being class takes time. It takes times as doing research takes time. So uh, it's the same thing. Uh, it takes time as uh, becoming head of the department it takes time. So it takes time of us. And uh, the time that you uh, use to edit a, a journal is invisible for our colleagues sometimes, for the university, and for the, the government agencies. So the first thing that you have to do is to tell uh, these actors that, uh, you know, we are working for you to publish your papers, you have to work to do that, and you have to be recognized, formally recognized for that. And after you have, you can discuss uh, how can you be remunerated or not, uh, recognized or not, the kind of recognition, etc. But the first thing is that to make it visible the work that you do when you are editing a journal. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Larry and Fabio. I, I, I agree with you. It's uh, uh, the, the part of a recognition of the work, it's uh, fundamental uh, for us as academic because uh, the recognition is it's part inherent of our work uh, it's part how uh, we we also work it's not just a vocational it's not just a contribution for the field it is also a contribution for for the field of course but it's also uh, recognition uh, as part of our work uh, excellent I also want to bring uh, another uh, question from the audience about what does the, the, the do the journal have been done uh, on to uh, bring uh, what have been published uh, to society uh, what of what what kind of uh, uh, initiatives to um, make this uh, uh, production these outputs available uh, not just for, for the the, the uh, academic community but as uh, society in general. Well, I, I'm not sure we do enough of that. We do have a, uh, a Twitter account, uh, which I confess I, I have nothing to do with. But then again, I have as little to do with Twitter as I can manage. But we do have a Twitter account. We send out emails. We send out we cross list, we promote. So we do a variety of things to bring uh, wider attention to the articles that we publish. We don't have the resources, frankly, to do a particular kind of promotion for particular articles. So when we have a special section or we have articles, we publish and we tweet and I'm told that helps. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know, but it is a good it is a good question. One of the advantages we have, is that because we're online, it's relatively easy and free. It's relatively easy to get the word out so that people can very quickly access. So if there's a tweet or something and someone is interested, they can click on it, it takes them right to the article. It's not, there's no obstacles to finding out or to getting access to the article if anyone is interested in it. They don't have to write for something, they don't have to look for it. So online has that advantage, but I'm not sure we do enough 
Um, and I, I, I'm not sure quite how we could do it. Uh, universities do this, as, as I assume in Brazil, they certainly do in the United States. Universities have you know, public relations officers who look for work in the university and send it out to, to journalists. And we do that somewhat, but here at the university, they don't necessarily view work we publish by scholars from other universities as part of their job. You know? So uh, I don't know whether, whether we do quite enough. Certainly authors do, and, and authors through social media and other means do promote the work that they publish. Uh, and again, because it's open access online, that is easier to do than it might be in other circumstances. But to some extent, the burden falls on the authors to try and make their work more visible. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this is a challenge uh, at the end. Uh, we, are, we are trying to discover how can we make uh, our research accessible to a larger audience. I see that uh, personally what I try to do is to use our articles in class to undergraduate students to show that uh, you can uh, learn journalism uh, by using reading a, a, a research article on journalism. And as I, I told you, we are trying to work on a, a, a kind of program uh, to uh, popularize the content of our special issue. At the end of the year, we publish an issue on populism and media, and we are trying to invite editors and the authors to make a kind of live or podcast and try to discuss on a on a simple way, on a, a more accessible language, what that the, the, what are the conclusion, uh, and may, maybe the, some someone outside the, 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 the university can be interested to this to this discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, to to put a uh, parenthesis uh, to ask Larry about the public relation sector in the university. It's not uh, the reality from uh, of all the universities in Brazil. Of course, we have the the, the public sector, uh, the uh, relation public sector in many universities, but not specifically for the uh, journals, uh, but for the, the institutional communication in general, but of course there are some, a, a few uh, universities that has this attention for the, the scientific journals. Uh, we are almost finishing our meeting, um, so sad, uh, but also so glad to be here with you. Uh, and uh, if you wanted to make some final remarks and uh, say what, what are the plans for the, the journals and some tips uh, for uh, 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 the, the interested uh, to publish and or submit an uh, article from uh, for the the journals, uh, I I really appreciate it to finish our meeting. Well, I don't know whether I have anything else to say. Uh, tips, I'd say submit articles. We'll see. Uh, as I said earlier, I think we have had fewer articles submitted from. Um, from Brazil than from other parts of Latin America. I think we've had articles from, from Chile and other parts of, of Latin America more frequently, but we are, we've published from articles from Brazil. And, you know, we are delighted to uh, receive them. Also, if people, I don't know how large your audience is here, but if anyone is interested in participating, in particular as a reviewer, uh, write us. If you go to our website, International Journal of Communication, not hard to find, ijoc.org, you can register. Uh, we have, at this moment, over 80,000 people registered uh, around the world. These people receive emails from us when we publish. They just today received um, emails from us, if they're registered, uh, saying, here are books that are available for review, books that we've received for review, would you be interested in reviewing a book, the list of books? Tell us who you are, that you're interested in reviewing. When we do that, as happened today, as always happens, within about two or three hours, we have to say, all right, we're stopped with too many. We're you know, full up. And then we go through it and end up 
you know, assigning book reviews. It's the, the primary way we assign, we assign book reviews. So go and register. And when you register, you can register as a reviewer. Uh, and you list your information, list the, the areas that you are uh, interested or competent to review in. And that's one of the primary sources we use to recruit reviewers. We look and see who has registered as a reviewer and what topics they list as appropriate for them to review. So this is a terrific way to get engaged and to become part of the, of the operation. And we would welcome more reviewers from Latin America from Brazil, you know, it's an ongoing process. So come join us. Thank you so much. I, I want to just to thank you for, for this opportunity and the discussion, it was really nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, want to, to, we are always open to receive submissions from, from our researchers, from Brazilian researchers. Uh, it's always uh, good to read the guidelines before submitting. It helps a lot. Yes. And if you have any doubts, uh, uh, you know, uh, we uh, write us an, uh, an email. We always answer our, our authors. Uh, we are always checking our email, our inbox. So you cannot, do not hesitate to, to write to us. Thank you so much, Larry, and thank you so much, Fabio. It was a fantastic meeting. Uh, uh, I am going to finish uh, now in Portuguese, and I am so sorry, Larry. Uh, agradecemos a participação de toda a audiência, né? Uh, agradecemos as perguntas. Infelizmente, não conseguimos trazer todas as perguntas que foram colocadas no chat, mas conseguimos incorporar boa parte delas, né? Então, agradeço uh, demais, uh, ao, inclusive, ao convite por estar aqui mediando esse debate. É, e gostaria de lembrá-los que uh, no dia 16 de setembro, às 14 horas, no horário de Brasília, vai acontecer o nosso segundo encontro de conversa com os editores. As convidadas serão a Mônica Chibita, do Journal of Africa Media Studies, de Uganda, e José Aidair, Aidar Prado, da revista Galáxia. A moderação será feita pela professora Laura Graziella, da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Então, mais uma vez, gostaria de agradecer a todos e tenham uma boa noite.